this is Chris Clark again. I am going to be reading part three of the chapter, A Hippo Banquet. A Hippo Banquet is from the book, uh, Travels in West Africa. It's written by Mary Kingsley, and it was first published in 1897. Again, this is part three of A Hippo Banquet. Our hasty trip across to the bank of the island on the other side being accomplished, we, in search of seclusion and in the hope that out of sight would mean out of mind to hippos, shot down a narrow channel between semi-island sandbanks. And those sandbanks, if you please, are covered with specimens, as fine a set of specimens as you could wish for, of the West African crocodile. These interesting animals are also having their siestas, lying sprawling in all directions on the sand with their mouths wide open. One immense old lady has a family of lively young crocodiles running over her, apparently playing like a lot of kittens. The heavy, musky smell they give off is most repulsive, but we do not rise up and make a row about this because we feel hopelessly in the wrong in intruding into these family scenes uninvited and so apologetically pull ourselves along rapidly, not even singing. The pace the canoe goes down that channel would be a wonder to Henley Regatta. When out of earshot, I asked Pagan whether there are many gorillas, elephants, or bush cows around here. Plenty too much, says he. And it occurs to me that the cornfields are growing golden green away in England, and soon there rises up in my mental vision a picture that fascinates my youth, representing Frederick Gerstocker of de Reis. That gallant man is depicted tramping on a serpent while he attempts to club with the butt end of a gun, a most lively savage who accompanied by a bison is attacking him in front. A terrific and obviously enthusiastic crocodile is grabbing the tail of the explorer's coat and the explorer says, and this is in German, Hurrah, des gib wieder einen Proktagen Artikel für mein Algen Zeigut, which means that makes another great article for the newspaper. I do not know where in the world uh, Gerstocker was at the time, but I should fancy hereabouts. My vigorous and lively conscience also reminds me that the last words a most distinguished and valuable a scientific friend had said to me before I left home was, always take measurements, Miss Kingsley, and always take them from the adult male. I know I have neglected opportunities of carrying this commission out on both of those banks, but I do not feel like going back. Besides, the men would not like it, and I have mislaid my yard, yard measure. The extent of water dotted, dotted with sandbanks and islands in all directions here is great and seems to be fringed uniformly by low swampy land beyond which to the north rounded lumps of hills show blue. On one of the islands is a little white house which I am told was once occupied by a black trader for John Holt. It looks a desolate, pla desolate place for any man to live in and the way the crocodiles and hippos must have come up on the garden ground in the evening time could not have enhanced its charm in the average conscious man. Cautious man. My men say, no man live for that place now. The factory, I believe, has been for some trade reason abandoned. Behind it is a great clump of dark colored trees. The rest of the island is now covered with hippograss, looking like a beautifully kept lawn. We lie up for a short rest at another island also a weird spot in its own way, for it is covered with a grove of only one kind of tree, which has a twisted, contorted, gray-white trunk and dull, lifeless-looking, green, hard foliage. I learned that these good people, to make a topographical confusion worse confounded, call a river by one name when you are going up it and by another when you are coming down it. Just as if you were to call the Thames the London when you are going up, and the Greenwich when you are coming down. The banks all around this lake or broad seem all light colored sand and clay. We pass out of it into a channel, current flowing north. As we are entering the channel between banks of grass grown sand, a superb white crane is seen, st is seen standing on the sand edge to the left. Gray shirt attempts to get a shot at it, 
but it alarmed at his unusual appearance, rises itself up with one of those graceful preliminary curtsies after one or two preliminary flaps, spreads its broad wings and sweeps away with its long legs trailing behind it like a thing on a Japanese screen. Grayshirt does not fire, but puts down his gun on the baggage again with its muzzle nestled against my left ear. A minute afterwards, we strike a bank and bang, off goes the gun, deafening me, singeing my hair and the side of my face slightly. Fortunately, the two men in front are at the moment in the recumbent position, attributive to the shock of the canoe jarring against the cliff edge of a bank, or they would have had the mis miscellaneous collection of bits of broken iron pots and lumps of lead frisking along in their vitals. It is, a little, it is a little difficult to make out how much credit Providence really deserves in this affair, but a good deal. Of course, if Providence had had taken the trouble to keep us off the bank or to remind Grayshirt to uncock his weapon, the thing would not have happened at all. But preliminary precaution is not Providence's peculiarity. Still, when the thing happened, it certainly rose up to it. I might have had the back of my head blown out and the men might have been killed. I only hope this won't confirm Pagan's permanently into superstition. For only a few minutes before, he had been showing me a big charm to keep him from being hurt by a gun. If he thinks about it, he will see that there is nothing in the charm because the other man who equally escaped was a charmless Christian. The river into which we ran zigzags about and then takes the course south-southeast. It is studded with islands slightly higher than those we have passed and thinly clad with forest. The place seems alive with birds. Flocks of pelican and crane rise up before us out of the grass, and every now and then a crocodile slides off the bank into the water. Wonderfully, like an old log they look, particularly when you see one letting itself roll and float down on the current. In spite of these interests, I began to wonder where in this lonely land we were to sleep tonight. In front of us are miles of distant mountains, but in no direction the slightest sign of a human habitation. Soon we passed out of our channel into a lovely, strangely melancholy, lonely-looking lake. Lake Nakovi, my friends tell me. It is exceedingly beautiful. The rich golden sunlight of the late afternoon, soon followed by the short-lived, glorious flushes of color of the sunset and the afterglow, play over the scene as we paddle across the lake to the north-northeast, our canoe leaving a long trail of frosted silver behind her as she glides over the mirror-like water, and each stroke of the paddle sending down air with it to come up again in, in luminous silver bubbles, not as before in swirls of sand and mud. The lake shore, in all directions, wreathed with nobly forested hills, indigo and purple in the dying daylight. On the north, northeast and northeast, uh, these come directly down into the lake. On northwest, north, south and southwest, there was a band of well forested ground behind which they rise. In the north and northeast part of the lake, several exceedingly beautiful wooded islands show with gray rocky beaches and dwarf cliffs. Sign of human habitation at first, there is none, and in spite of its beauty, there is something which I am almost going to say was repulsive. The men evidently felt the same way as I did. Had anyone told me but th that the air that lay on the lake was poisonous, or, in, or in, that in among the forest lay some path to regions of utter death, I should have said, it looks like that. But no one said anything, and we only looked round uneasily, until the comfortable souled singlet made the unfortunate observation that he smelt blood. We all called him an utter fool to relieve our minds and made our way towards the second island. When we got near enough to it to see details, a large village showed among the trees on its summit and a steep dwarf cliff overgrown with trees and creeping plants came down to a small beach covered with large water washed gray stones. There was evidently some kind of row going on at that village that took a lot of shouting too. We made straight for the beach and drove our canoe among its outlying rocks and then each of my men stowed his paddle quickly, swung on, a, swung on his ammunition bag and picked up his ready loaded gun, sliding the skin sheath off the lock. 
Pagan got out onto the stones alongside the canoe just as the inhabitants became aware of our arrival. And abandoning what I hope was a mass meeting to remonstrate with the local authorities on the un insanitary state of the town, came a brown mass of naked humanity down the steep cliff path to attend to us, whom they evidently regarded as an imperial interest. Things did not look restful, nor these fans personally pleasant. Every man among them, no women showed, was armed with a gun, and they loosened their shovel-shaped knives in their sheaths as they came, evidently regarding a fight quite as imminent as we did. They drew up about 20 paces from us in silence. Pagan and Grayshirt, who had joined them, held out their unembarrassed hands and shouted out the name of the fan man they had said they were friendly with. Kiva! Kiva! The fans stood still and talked angrily among themselves for some minutes, and then Silence said to me, It would be bad, Pavlever, if Kiva no, no live in this place, in a tone that conveyed to me the idea he thought this unpleasant contingency almost a certainty. The passenger exhibited unmistakable symptoms of wishing he had come by another boat. I got up from my seat in the middle of the canoe and leisurely strolled ashore, saying to the line of angry faces, Mambab Wali, in an unconcerned way, although I well knew it was etiquette for them to salute first. They grunted, but not, did not commit themselves further. A minute after they parted to allow a fine-looking, middle-aged man, naked save for a twist of dirty cloth round his loins and a bunch of leopard and wild cat skins hung from his shoulder by a strip of leopard, leopard skin to come forward. Pagan went for him with a rush, as if he were going to clasp him in his ample bosom, but holding his hands just off from touching Fan's shoulder in the usual way, while he said to Fan, "'Don't you know me, my beloved Kivid? Surely you have not forgotten your old friend?' Kivid grunted freely, feelingly, and raised up his hands and held them off, just touching Pagan, and we breathed again. Then Grayshirt made a rush in the crowd and went through great demonstrations of affection for another gentleman whom he recognized as being a fan friend of his own and whom he had not expected to meet here. I looked around to see if there were any, any not any fan from the upper Ogawi whom I knew to go for, but could not see that it could go on in the strength of a previous acquaintance. And on their individual merits, I did not feel inclined to do even this fashionable imitation embrace. Indeed, I must say that never, even in a picture book, had I seen such a set of wild, wicked-looking savage, savages as though we faced that night, and with whom it was touch and go for 20 of the longest minutes I have ever lived. Whether we fought for our lives, lives I was going to say, but it would not have been even for that, for merely for the price of them.